Last week, if you remember, if not, you may want to go back and watch it. But we did a, um, like a chart. I don't know if you want to call it a chart, but in the outlines that I've presented this morning, I've given you a little bit of a, um, I call it a chronological mapping. Um, it's like the third page, the last page, I think. And um, so that, that's there for you because the board is going to be erased. And this is for you to take these notes home, have them. They're not profound, but they are biblical. They're all, they're all, they are mapped out in the Bible. I don't think they're debatable, although anything and everything is debatable anymore. But we're looking at this morning, continuing that message last week. And the emphasis has been over the last year on dominion. But we've kind of like shifted a little bit. It's still dominion, but we're taking like a little bit of sidebar because the dominion is from his kingdom. So when you think of kingdom, you think of God's personal um, presence and his manifested rule and reign. And that's what we think of. That's what we define kingdom as, although there are other definitions. So you can't take dominion apart from the kingdom. So keep in mind that we're still talking about dominion, but we're focusing on the kingdom. So last week, or this past week, I posted a um, thing on Facebook, and I don't really post a lot of little ditties on there. Um, but when I do, just know this is because I heard it. And um, and the one that I did, and I'm going to say, I'm going to, I'll tell you what it is. And before I say it, I was not being political. Because I don't, I don't get political. Although, let me just say this. What's the purpose of the church? It's not to integrate with the world system. It's to speak to it. Okay, so we're, we're living in the kingdom of God. or living from the kingdom of God. And here are the kingdoms of this world. We don't jump on board and get in step with what they're doing and take our cues from it. But the church is called to speak to it. And, um, and what they do with the truth that we speak, that's between them and God. Ultimately, we're, we're to be the salt and light of the world. So keeping that in mind, listen to this, this post that I, uh, I put up. Because we're going into another election, uh, another election cycle, and we're going to hear a lot of rhetoric, a lot of, and the church, I hope we don't, I hope the church as a, as a whole, or in general, doesn't do what we did in 2016 and 2020 get political. Take sides. Now let me say this. Joshua is on the Lord's side, we, we, we believe, and he's going into Canaan to fight, and he sees an angel, uh, or he sees, it ends up being an angel, but he sees a, a warrior with a sword in his hand, and he doesn't recognize this guy. He's not from his tribe. So he thinks, well, I don't know if you're from, if you're a foreigner, you, are you the guy that part of the tribe that we're going up against? And he asks him, whose side are you on? Are you for us or against us? And here it's an angel of the Lord. But what do you think the angel would say? Well, if you're Republican, I'm Republican. If you're a Democrat, I'm a Democrat. If you're a Baptist, I'm Baptist. If you're for Jesus, then I'm for Jesus. I'm on your side. Is that what he said? He said, whose side are you on? You for us or against us? He said, neither. You need to be on my side. Because God doesn't take sides. The kingdom, does, the kingdom of God is not <coughs> here on earth to take sides. On any issue. It's to speak into the issue or to both sides, or however many sides there are, truth that the Holy Spirit has been leading us into. Does that, does that make sense? So my, my post is, with a demonic left and a fake right, where do you turn? I'm trying to say, look, don't engage that system. You turn to the kingdom of God and speak to that system from the platform of God's kingdom, out of his truth. Is, now, is that being political? No. Was John the Baptist being political? Or whatever, if he's speaking to Herod that you have your brother's wife, 
Is that being political? Is that, or is he, or is he speaking from and John's day? Remember, up to John and the uh, up to the law and the prophets was John the Baptist. So John the John the Baptist is representing the law when he's speaking to Herod. We don't see Jesus speaking to Herod about his adultery. In fact, we're going to see Jesus let an adulterer go free. Oh, John ain't going to let no adulterer go free, is he? But he's representing the law and the prophets. Jesus is representing the fulfillment of the law and the prophets and bringing us into the new covenant. Two different ministries. But both are going to be speaking from the kingdom to whoever listens. Does that make sense? So, um, so we're speaking. This is why you cannot take sides. Um, because understand this. I'm gonna, I know I'm going to wear you to death with this. I don't care. It is the foundation of everything we believe. That <coughs> everything starts off in the garden. Everything. You miss this, <coughs> I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you. You're going, to, you're, you're, going to, you're going to fall into the spirit of the age. And all the false propaganda. So we've got two trees. The tree of life, the tree of knowledge, of good and evil. Now, where do you think, no matter what country you're listening from or here, what, where does, your, where does the, the party systems come from? This represents the kingdom of God. And this represents the kingdoms of the world. I'm just abbreviating. All right. So, does the two-party system that we have did they was that a revelation of the kingdom of God, or was that a revelation of well, this is a good way of doing it? And honestly, the way our founding fathers put it together, it is a really good way of putting together a, a, a constitution. It really it's probably the best, and I believe God was part of helping engineer that. But it's not kingdom. You understand, God just didn't just loose the world into it. He's entering into it. So he's entering into what's happening with, with, you know, his influences. But nevertheless, it's still the kingdoms of this world versus the kingdom of God. Now, in John chapter, it's not in your outline. You may want to write it down there or look it up. But in John chapter um, 18, I don't think I have it, do I? Okay. John chapter 18, verse... 36, Jesus tells Pilate, my kingdom, because Pilate say, look, they're calling you a king, and every king has a kingdom. kingdom. So where's your kingdom? Because it can't be here, because I'm, 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 I'm lording it over here. So Herod's over there, and we got, we got Caesar. I don't know where you fit, because you're in my geographical area. So where, he goes, my kingdom is what? Not of this world. Now, if you look that that scripture up in the Greek, according to the, the Greek, here's what Jesus said. My kingdom is not from this world. So that means I didn't get it out of this tree to present it here, making it part of this world. I didn't pull out of this system to create another system. So he says, my kingdom did not come from this world. Or another way, in the Greek, you can see it as, my kingdom is um, not from or out of this world. It doesn't come from it. It doesn't originate from it. Jesus was saying that the origin of his kingdom, its source, was not the world system. So Christ, his empire, kingdom, was from another world we call the heavens. Okay? That's pretty self-explanatory, but some people seem to conflate God's kingdom with the kingdoms of this world by being political, by Americanizing um, the gospel. So God starts off, and you know, follow this trick. Now, I'm gonna, my introduction is long, but we're gonna get we're gonna get to the, the meat of it here. But I gotta lay this foundation. God creates the heavenly realm. In the very beginning of beginnings, He creates the heaven and the earth. And in heaven he populates it with angels. And God rules those heavens and he is the king of that realm, the kingdom of heaven, before earth. Now when you get to earth we'll, we'll get to earth here in a minute. So God then creates earth 
And what he does on earth is he crowns earth with man. And um, humans live Adam and Eve in God's presence and they minister to him in a garden called Eden. Eden is to be the beachhead from which humanity is to rule the earth with God's authority with heaven's influence. Okay? Because if you don't see where I'm going to go, you can't have dominion. You're not going to have it. I promise you, you will not have dominion if you're conflating the kingdoms. Can't. And I'm going to prove it by John the Baptist. And you wait till you see this. It's right in front of our eyes and, and we miss it. Alright, so after the fall, the enemy, the devil who fell from heaven, if you subscribe to that, and is on earth, begins to rule through human beings by getting Adam and Eve to eat from that tree. That's why we start off with the trees. And unleashing good and evil on the earth. You say, well, what's, what's wrong with the least? We've got good. No, good is evil. It's, it's conflated with evil. It's integrated with evil. So anything good is evil when it comes from this tree. That's a fact. Otherwise, well, come on, Lord. Can they not eat out of the good of it? What if they just eat the good fruit and leave the bad fruit alone? It's all bad. You'll die. No matter what good you do, you die. Because it's a separation from God and His righteousness, His goodness. All right? So, what ends up happening after Adam and Eve falls and um, separates and enters in and gets alienated in the darkness of their mind, as Paul tells us, what ends up happening is God doesn't just let this get unleashed and does nothing about it, but He enters into all things for the purpose of working them. For good, which is his eternal purpose. Romans 8, 28, God working his eternal purpose in our screw-ups, in, in life and humanity. So what God does at this point, he starts off with the, the tree of life in a garden called Eden, the Garden of Eden. And then they, and I'm going to show you that they get, there's a reason why they get, I don't, I don't know, maybe I won't show you. Maybe if I just don't say it and you pick it up in scriptures. It's better if you pick it up than me tell you. We'll look at some scriptures here in a minute. But after Eden, and they're out in the garden, God picks a man called Abraham. Okay? Then after Abraham, he has 12 tribes, 12 sons. They're going to be Israel. Now, this is repeat from yesterday, last week. And out of Israel, which is a nation... A man, watch this evolution, a family, 70 goes down to Egypt, so they're not very populated yet. A man, a garden. What is he doing? He starts with a garden, he starts with a tree that they're to eat from, tree of life, in a garden. Okay, stop there. What's God's purpose in this, in this garden? Is for his rule and his reign. His authority, his life to be projected or manifested or to grow the garden into all the world. Because as they populate, is the garden going to get a little small? Yeah. So as they populate and manifest God's life, the garden grows. The kingdom grows and overtakes a dark, chaotic world that's just wilderness at that point. If they had not unleashed the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What would have happened was the garden and its light and its glory would have just moved its boundaries and took over the darkness with light. Okay? That's, that's how it should have worked. But you know what happened. So because of the fall, God's not going to give up on his rule and reign and his glory and purpose. So he's going to pick a man and he's going to work with that man for a while and God's going to do everything through at, through Abraham that he wanted to do through Adam. He's going to do it through Abraham. Abraham now, through the covenant of Abraham, is going to produce a family, 12 sons, and those 12 sons are going to have 70 when they get down to Egypt. And then they're going to, they're going to be so multiplied that Pharaoh's, while they're in Egypt, is going to freak out and say, these people, we're going to have to put them in slavery, or they're going to put us in slavery because they're breeding and multiplying like rabbits. But they become a nation. And then they get out of Egypt and they go to Canaan. 
Now we're going to stop there. We're going to pick it up here in a minute. But what is, do you see what he's doing? He starts with a garden to manifest his glory. That gets messed up. Then he goes to man to manifest his glory, his goodness, his purposes and plans. That evolves into a family. That evolves into a nation, Israel, that he's going to give land to. So what? So we go from a garden to a man to a family that's a nation that's going to have their own land. And the whole purpose of this land is that they do what God tells them to do. His glory and his goodness will prevail over the, they'll, they'll, they'll win the nations. If you don't believe this, we're going to look at the scripture at the very end, but don't, don't go to it. Where God, well let's go to it, the very last slide. I might as well, I want you to see it. 2 8. This is God talking to his son, eternity past, before Jesus came. Ask of me, and what's God going to give him? The nations. For your inheritance. And God's going to give Jesus the ends of the earth for his possessions. That's where all this is going. And that's what is being done here. This was this was this was not this is Psalms. Jesus ain't even been born yet. This is the eternal purpose of God that the church gets to co-create with or co-partner with, with with the Father on earth. Okay? And this is what he's doing. He's going from a garden to a man, to a family, to a nation, and he's going to rule and reign through the whole Old Testament from this land. Of course, they get, they get taken out and brought back in because of their rebellion. But ultimately, you see God always trying to find a place on earth to manifest his glory and his purposes and plan. Does that make sense? If you don't get this, you're going to conflate the kingdoms. And then you're going to get involved in and you're going to get sucked up into the false propaganda, everything you're hearing, and you're going to buy in, completely miss that this whole thing's about a kingdom and a king. And you're going to be all up in everything else but what you're supposed to be. Wait till you see where this goes. I'm telling you, this, this, this is the, go the gospel of the kingdom. All right, so what I want you to see, let me get back to my notes because I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Um, so Cain is going to be the place where God will rule the earth through human beings, the place where the kingdom of heaven will touch the, the planet. <coughs> now look at these scriptures. Now what you see, you don't believe that you can take the Garden of Eden and connect it to, and basically this is Zion, okay? Um, watch, what, what's, this? I think it's the second slide. Now look at Isaiah 51.3. The Lord will surely comfort Zion. That's Canaan. That's the nation of Israel from Adam, or Abraham. The Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden. So he's showing you that this land is going to be like Eden. He is bringing, showing you that you can make, you can connect these dots that I'm connecting right now with this scripture. I'm going to make her deserts like Eden, her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. So there's a progress. It's the same. I'm not going to throw a garden now. I'm going to start with a man who's going to have a family, who's going to become a nation, and I'm going to give them land. And there, I'm going to rule through them from that land. Yeah, go to the next one. I think it's Ezekiel. All right, look at this. They will say, this land that was laid waste has become like the Garden of Eden. The cities that were lying in ruins, desolate and destroyed, and now fortified and inhabited. Again, I'm just showing you, he's making a comparison to Zion, Canaan, the land of God, to the original purpose, or the original first original purpose, however you want to look at it, the Garden of Eden. Alright? So God's kingdom, right, let's back up, Get your look, look at your outline. Up to this point, the enemy is not sleeping. What? I just showed you this. I don't know how many thousand years that is, but I just showed you this. Now, what is the devil doing? He is not sleeping. Because while God is doing this, the devil... God picks Abraham. God, the devil's going to pick a guy. Do you believe he can pick a guy? 
does not say that the devil entered into Judas. Does not say that the devil was asked permission to sift Simon Peter like wheat. I mean, there's all kinds of scriptures that you can see where the enemy uses man. So God's going to pick a man, Abraham, and, and Satan's a counterfeit. He's going to pick a man called Nimrod. You read Genesis 11, you just go right through there, and you don't realize this is the beginning of the kingdoms of this world getting structured, coming together to fulfill every plan and purpose that's in this tree of knowledge of good and evil. Through humans. Satan can't do it. He has to have humans. Just like God's not going to come down and do it, he has to have humans. All right? So Nimrod comes in, then he fortifies a city, and then they're going to call, build what they call a tower of Babel. Well, they're going to reach heaven. They're going to, they're going to do something significant apart from God. Here's God using man to do something. Here's the enemy using fallen man to do something. All right? God enlightens these people, but these people are not yet enlightened. All right? So then you got the Tower of Babel. Does that make sense? So while we go from a Tower of Babel, which is a group of men ruling and reigning on earth, this family is being formed into a nation, and this is going to be all the nations except one, Israel, that he says, ask of me and I'll give you these nations for an inheritance. Not a nation for an inheritance. He's already got them. These nations that the enemy, these are those in darkness. Remember he said, Abraham, you're going to be a blessing to who? All families of the earth. All nations. Does that make sense? All right. So all these nations are happening and they're clashing with Israel during the whole Old Testament because the devil does not, the enemy does not, the kingdom of light, kingdom of darkness, you got to clash. Not the rock group, but an actual clash. Does this make sense so far? Once you get this, the whole Bible makes sense. You, I mean, the, the bird's eye view, the you know, laying this gestalt, it all it begins to start making sense. All right, so that's what the devil's doing. It's a counterfeit to what God's doing. It's easy. Once you see it, you can't unsee it, in my opinion. All right, so um, so God's kingdom and the kingdom of this world were clashing in the Old Testament up to Jesus. Now, God's plans does not stop at Canaan. All right, God's plans does not stop at Canaan. I said I stopped here because I had to. Now we start... This is still moving ahead. And by the time Jesus shows up, we're dealing with one huge nation. Remember who it is? Down here. Rome. A big nation. That is occupying the land, Jerusalem, Israel. See? Now, what we've got when Jesus shows up, this kingdom has swallowed up this kingdom and they're in occupation under occupation of this kingdom when Jesus shows up. Now, he says my kingdom is not of this world, so I'm not going to fight this kingdom with swords, with legislation, with a political party, or through education, or through entertainment, or through the arts, or any of the seven mountains you want to pick, he ain't going, he's not doing this because to pick a mountain would be he's part of this world. Hmm? Because he's a, this, this kingdom he's talking about is a standalone kingdom. It has to stay separate. Come out from among them and what? Save the Lord of God. Come out from among them. Paul says this. It's not old covenant scripture. Paul says this. Come out from among them and be separate. And that's what your water baptism should have done. Separated you from all these kingdoms, all the influences of these kingdoms, by staying within the realm of the kingdom of heaven, which is in you, Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of God is within you. But this is what Jesus came. And it says, he came preaching a message of the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God is used 84, 85 times in the gospel. And it's a message. It's the gospel of the kingdom. It's the, you go to Acts and they're talking about the kingdom and the message of the kingdom. 
Because it's all about the kingdom of God. And the church has lost the emphasis on the kingdom of God because they've conflated it with America or some other kingdoms of this world. And they're trying to Christianize all this. And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. So, so we're not about taking over an educational system. We're not here to take over this or that. We are here to speak to these things. And by winning those people that are in these systems, then they begin to start winning people. And it's about people, not the organization, not the politics of it. It's about the people. And then you start flipping a nation when you can start changing the lives of people. Not to take over the system, but to, but to continue to speak to it in hopes to influence it from this kingdom. By being the light and salt. How are you going to be light and salt if you don't speak to these other entities or these other kingdoms? Is this making sense so far? I'm just really trying to lay this out for anybody. It'd be easy so anybody can get this. So, um, the whole purpose, remember what Jesus said in Matthew 6.10. Um, here's the prayer. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that means that it cannot, what happens on in the kingdoms of this world cannot be fixed by the kingdoms of this world. Jekyll can't fix high. So it's got to be an, an empowerment, a, 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 um, a group of people that are enlightened by the kingdom of God, because the kingdom is within us, to be the light and salt to speak to these other nations in order to win these people over. Ask of me and I'll give you the nations. We're the light and sound of that. We're part, we're the vehicle and how that works out. Now, after the resurrection, okay, so Jesus comes and sets up a kingdom. Not in this world. After his resurrection, he places that kingdom in us, Luke 17, 21, and then it's on earth as it is in heaven. That's on. We're, that's what this is all about. But the enemy will continue building his kingdom on earth as Jesus is, in, is releasing his kingdom in hearts and lives. The enemy will still literally physically be building his kingdom on this earth, deceiving nations as the prince of this world. Now, I want to show you some stuff. I don't know what scripture says. Just give them all to me in order, starting with Matthew. Because a lot of people um, have a problem with the enemy. Either they've deconstructed the devil into your psych psychological mind, and that's all he is. He's not real. It's a, it's, he's a figment of your imagination. To the point that the devil has been completely taken care of, so he's sitting over there in the corner, and he can't move. So every... So I don't know where, but, I'm, I, but look at these scriptures and you interpret how you want to interpret it. Okay, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain. So to me, this is a real person, a real entity, talking to Jesus, and he's not having some psychosis going on inside of him. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this, this is the devil speaking, all this I will give to you. Now what? All this that I have been working on all this time. And all these kingdoms. Now here comes Jesus and here's all these kingdoms and here's especially Rome. I mean they're under. So, so understand. Satan was giving Jesus an, a way to get out from Rome occupation. Which everybody wanted. Hey you can be out from under Rome today. I'll give you Rome. Look, you won't be under it. You'll be over it. No. Why? Because my kingdom is not of this world. I'm doing this thing totally different from an invisible realm called heaven through hearts and lives of people that will represent and manifest my life on earth. Okay? So we see that. Next scripture. The God of this age. Who's that? It's got to be an entity has blinded the minds. So there's this thing, some, whatever you want to call it, is blinding the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who's the image of God. So the God of this world, the devil, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Now who's going to enlighten these blinded minds? Hmm? You, from the kingdom of heaven, when you speak into these lives, the truth. Next. Now look at this one. This is Paul. 
in which you once, talking about those who were not enlightened, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, you weren't walking to the course of this kingdom, you were walking to the course of this world. Now understand, we did a series on this back in 2020, that there is a mind behind this system. Something's developing this with, with ideology, with dogma, um, lies, deceptions. He says you once walked according to it. To, now he just doesn't say according to the course of this world. This is the course of this world. We can look at Babylon. We can look at Syria. We can look at Egypt. All these kingdoms are, are, are in the Old Testament. We're, you know Alexander the Great's in this? Where he conquered all his known worlds and at the age of 32 put his head between his legs and cried because there were no more kingdoms to conquer at 30 some years old. He's, he's involved in this history. This is history, guys. This isn't make believe stuff. He says, You once walked according to the course of this world and doesn't stop there. Paul says, You also walked according to the prince of the power of the air. Of the air. So now there's a mind behind this system. There's a puppet master going on to the, those that are blind and deceived. He says, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Now it's still working in Paul's day. And it's still working in our day. A demonic left and a fake right, if you want to Americanize this, still working. There, the, our politics is walking according to the course of this world, according to the spirit of the age that's now working in the sons of disobedience, among whom also you once conducted your lives in the, in, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. That's still happening today. Next. Um, Jesus, this is John. These next three checks, verses is from John. Right here they are, all on one slide. Now is the judge. This is Jesus speaking. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. An entity. It's not everybody's figments of their imaginations will all of a sudden all their psychosis will be gone. He's not casting that out because it's not because it's an entity. I, look at the next one. I will no longer talk much with you, Jesus speaking, for the rulers of this world, the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. Something's coming, an entity is coming, and in the last one, he says, he says, of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So he keeps talking about a ruler of this world. Paul picks up on it and says that the God of this world has blinded the eyes, and we know who he's talking about. Okay? Does that all make sense? All right. Whether you agree with it or not. Now, in Colossians 1, I don't think we have the, the slide. Colossians 1, verse 13 and 14, literally talks about God taking you out of the kingdom that this dude's ruling over, the kingdoms of this world, and translating you up to this kingdom, the kingdom of his dear son. So you can see that you walked according to the course of this world at one time, by nature, children of wrath, whatever you want to, however you want to interpret that, but that's what he says. Children of wrath, course of this world, walking according to the flesh and the mind, somehow, through the enlightening of the Holy Spirit, you have been translated through death, burial, resurrection, the cross, from this realm to the kingdom of God that's been placed within you. Luke 17, 21. You, you've made a transition from one kingdom to another. Never to have one foot here and one foot here, and try to have a kumbaya with these people down here. Ain't going to happen. He says, don't throw your pearls before the swine. Those who don't have eyes to see, ears to hear. They're going to come back and rip you to pieces. So you cannot mix. You cannot conflate these two kingdoms together. Your baptism in water severed that. Okay? Now, we'll, we'll get into that maybe here in a minute. Now, watch this. A picture of this, which... We're getting to it now. The picture of this is Egypt and the Red Sea. Israel had to have a severing from Egypt. And the Red Sea, which is a type of their water baptism, 
was their death and burial coming out on the other side of the land of Canaan was their resurrection and that Red Sea which is the type of your baptism is the cutoff point of that Canaan. So there's a severing. Would you, you have to believe that. That's so orthodox in, in most Christendom. So there is a cut, okay? You're done with this world and now you're, you're serving the kingdom of God. Okay? Now watch this. Here's where my message begins. Alright, you ready for this? John the Baptist. We have to talk about him because he is the one called forerunner who is going to preach the kingdom and prepare the people for the kingdom that is coming and the king who's going to come with it called the Messiah. Everybody believes that. It's not debatable. Of course, anything's debatable. If you're, if you're called, you can debate it, I guess. Um, does that make sense so far? Now watch this. John the Baptist being the forerunner of the kingdom. He's part of the Old Testament prophets who have foretold about this kingdom all the way through Daniel, Ezekiel, all these prophets were looking for this kingdom. And finally, John, the last of the Old Covenant prophets and the law, he says, I get to be the last prophet who's going to usher in by pointing to the Messiah who's going to bring the kingdom. So this is why Jesus says John's the greatest of all. He got to be the one to say, there he is, the Lamb of God that takes the message which is presenting the kingdom. The king and his kingdom is coming at this strategic point when Jesus shows up. Okay? Does that make sense? You follow me? All right? Now watch this. Now let's look at John. He's a huge, he's a big piece in this. Now, watch this. He has a, he's a radical prophet. John is a radical prophet. Doesn't take much to understand that. Now here's, here's what you what you need to know. His, how many have watched The Chosen? The, the, the series The Chosen. What does Peter think of John? If you really watched it. What does Peter think of John the Baptist? Does Peter see him as a great prophet like Jesus does? He's, well, and of course this is a, this is a movie. He says, keeps calling him Crazy John. He's a nut. Peter thinks John the Baptist is a nut. And rightly so, if you're just going to look at him on, from the outward appearance. But you can't do that. J watch this. You ready for this? What God had made John to be outwardly is what God is looking for us inwardly. You get stuck on his outfit and his diet and all that. And it's like, okay, he's crazy John. Wait a minute. It's, there's, a, there's, there's something that there's a metaphor to all this. His outward appearance is a metaphor. His outward appearance is symbolic. It's spiritualizing something God is looking for on the inside of us as recipients and promoters of this kingdom. And you're not going to understand this unless you understand John the Baptist. I'm telling you, this is huge. You're going to miss it all and conflate these kingdoms if you don't understand what I'm telling you, what I'm not telling you about John the Baptist. And this is why we can, the church completes these kingdoms, and they don't, they don't, they, they've never severed the kingdoms of this world. They were never taught. Yeah, they all got, the funny thing is, they all got water baptized, but did nothing about it, never lived it out. They actually just saw it as something they needed to do after they got saved, and that's about it. Okay? Now watch this. His outward appearance matched, the, matched his message. His outward appearance matched his message. John showed outwardly what God was looking for inwardly. Let's look at it. His coat was made of camel hair. Why? What's the significance of his coat made of... Nobody was wearing coat was made with camel hair because camels were ceremonially unclean animals. So he is representing the law as a prophet wearing an, un, an unclean animal making him ceremonially unclean. What's that speak toward? That John was not part of any religious tradition. He had to make a break with religious tradition. As, the, as Jesus is saying to us, when you come up here, when you get Colossians 1, when you get translated from here to here, you break with all religious traditions. And John's going to do it by his outfit. Alright, does that make sense? Now watch, what's next? He breaks with religious tradition. His diet was what? 
Locust and honey. No one's eaten locust and honey. What does this show? That John had broken with materialism, greed, and worldly pleasure. He's not eating what everybody... He's not in step with religious tradition. He's not in step with culture, materialism, and the greed of the day. He is, he is looked upon as a nut, but what God is saying is he severed himself from what you see in Jerusalem, you don't see in John. All right, you ready for the next one? His hair and his beard, because he was a Nazarite, his head, his hair, and his beard were never cut. What is that? While everybody else is shaving their beards and cutting their hair, he's not. Because he's also making a break and defying human customs. Well, you need a haircut. Who says? Human customs. Why don't you trim that beard, man? You got food and look. I see a locust moving around. And that honey, it's all gunked up there. You need to, you need to, you need to shave that. That's 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 customs. Complying with customs. He's not going to do that. Now here's another one. He lived in the wilderness, showing he had no attachments to the present world system and again or culture. He's not going into town. To see John, where you got to go? To the wilderness. He's a son of a priest. Remember, his dad was was doing the ceremonial stuff in the in the in the temple when God made him mute when he said that you're going to have a son, you're going to call him John. The, so his dad's a priest, which means he's going to be a priest. Is John the Baptist a priest that you're going to find in the temple? He doesn't take up the priesthood, which he should. He's not found in the temple doing the work that his father did previously. Can you imagine what his dad thought of him? He's a nut. You know what the Bible calls us? A peculiar people. Aliens. Because we don't fit. We were, we were never supposed to fit down here. We were supposed to speak to what we don't fit into. Because we are separate from the kingdoms of this world. Alright? So he lived in the wilderness, so he had no attachments to the present world system. Son of a priest. He had no priest. He, he is not a priest serving in the temple. I mean, that's the church. You think he should be in the church if he's going to win the church. Nope. He's outside the church. Showing that he was not part of the religious systems. John's appearance and <coughs> ways show he was not in step with the culture or the religious systems. You know what the church is trying to do? Keep in step with culture. And keep the religious traditions going or create new ones. Called fads. Because we got to fit, man. We got to fit. Because if we don't fit, we don't grow. And if we don't grow, then we're not light. If we're not light, we're not salt. So we got to grow. So we got to have all these bells and whistles and compromise the message. We got to make it a friendly user church. Because if you come down too hard, you'll chase the people off. But we forget that Jesus told his disciples, Whom my heavenly Father did not plant, he will uproot. So every church has to have an uprooting, not a growing spurt. All right, can I stay, think I should say what I just came across this past week? You ain't going to like it. You are not going to like it. It's going to be, we're going to go an extra 10 minutes today. Is that okay if I do this? Yes. Exactly. Okay. So I'm sitting there, and I'm, 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 I'm meditating this week. I got my office. In the last month, I got my office where I want it. And man, it is just my my sanctuary or my sanctum or whatever you want to call it. But anyway, I'm meditating. And, um, and the Holy Spirit brings me that I'm seeing more and more that the church is all about numbers and likes and clicks and, 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 and um, what kind of things that called? Clickbait, whatever. We're just, we're just, we, we, we're, we're deconstructing a lot of stuff just to get the people to watch us so that we can proselyte people from one belief system to another belief system. And I'm just seeing that where's the, where's the gospel of the, the kingdom being preached? I just see a lot of proselyting from one doctrine to another doctrine through deconstructionism. And we're just so worried about our doctrines, 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 that we're not preaching the gospel of the kingdom at all. And then you got another church that's worried about self-help do-it-yourself gospel, 
And it's all about making you a better person. And so it's all about that. That's not the gospel of the kingdom. Then we're coming up on the election cycle. So we're going to hear a lot about the, the, the government, how, what the church needs to do. And now we're going to be political. And he never told us to be political. He told us to preach the kingdom. Okay? I'm, I, I know what I'm on this, what I'm seeing. So but what, what I'm really seeing is this is all about how many people we can get in our church. I mean, every pastor is all about growing his church. Every single one of them, minus the rarities. But everything I'm seeing, grow, 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 do, 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 more, 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 half, half, half. Okay? And then if a church isn't growing or they're small, well, then they're in that mom and pop store that gets swallowed up by a big Walmart. Because small churches on a very shoestring gut budget cannot match these larger churches. They got a lot of so much money they don't know what to do with. It. Can't compete. However, here's what the Lord showed me that ended that should end the numbers game for every pastor. If they, if they hear this, should end the numbers game, end it completely, and never be about likes. How many people like that? Well, there's about 50. Wow, should have been a lot more than 50. Lot. How many people watched my video last week? Oh, should have been a whole lot. And this ends the number games. <coughs> and it's so simple, but it has to be the Holy Spirit showing it to you. So, my numbers are not going to be correct because I was not planning on sharing this. There were, in Jerusalem, 1.5 million males. 1.5 million males. In, now, you want to add kids? I don't know how many, how many families got kids. Two kids, four kids, at five. I, I don't know. Huh? At the time of Jesus. What? At the time. At the time of Jesus. At the time of Jesus. 1.5 male, male. I looked it up. I Googled it. Now, Google's wrong. Sorry. But I think we're close. So I think Josephus says there's like two, one to two million that got slaughtered in 70 AD. All right. So you times that by women if it's 50-50. And what do you have? Three million. And if each family has two kids, what's that? Six. Hmm? Six. All right. So let's say six million people. And you want to count kids, let's say three million people. Jesus had three million people in his town in Jerusalem. Not counting what they call today the West Bank, which is Samaria and Judea. Okay, not counting that. Just counting Jerusalem. In the city of Jerusalem. Where he was at a lot. Right? So, God says stop there. Shouldn't count Morgantown. But if we're looking at a tri-city area, do you know how many people are populated in Fairmont, Clarksburg, and Morgantown? I Googled that too. And my numbers are going to be rounded off. 75,000. So Jesus, out of 3 million people, has 12 disciples. 12 men. He picks out 3 million people, 12 men. The best we can do is he sent 70 out. So we'll give him 70. He can't be a failure at 12. We've got to, we've got to up that number. We know he sent 70 out. And we know that after the resurrection, there was only 120 in the upper room waiting for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's it. Out of 3 million people. Today, there will be pastors that would call him, a, not him personally, but somebody that had these numbers, a complete failure and does not need to exist as a church. Horrible numbers. Horrible. I can't remember the percentage because I wasn't planning on doing this, but Jesus had probably... You remember, you remember the percentage? You just times the percentage. It's, it's low. I mean, what's the percentage of one? We'll, give, we'll bump him to 120. Let's just be really nice. God, we don't want to be too embarrassed. Bump him to 120. Well, somebody got a calculator? What's the percentage of 120 people versus 3 million? What's the percentage that he reach? It's low. So God says to me, how many people do you got? Now do a percentage of 75,000 people. I have better stats than Jesus in this church. I have better stats than Jesus working my percentages versus working his. And God, I heard it loud and clear. <coughs> the 
numbers game is over because it's not about numbers. It's not. It's who God gives you. It's and it's not going to be big numbers because you can't. Can Jesus effectively disciple over seventy people? That's why you only had twelve. You can only be effective with a small group of people, and then that group goes out and has a group, and that group goes out, and we've made it denominations, we've made it big mega churches, we have we've made it about numbers and not discipleship and one on one. You cannot do this thing with big numbers. He didn't. And with that 70, I'm going to show you in Acts, he turned the world upside down. We got this mega crap going on, all these numbers, and we can't move a wing on an act. We can't win an election. If you want to get political. Huh? So stop the number. Don't come in here and go, wow, where's everybody at? Well, I, it's not up to us to know where everybody's at. We're here. Isn't that what matters? Well, we don't have the worship they do. We don't have the parking they do. We don't have the programs they do. Well, Jesus wouldn't have any of that because he didn't have enough people to have all that. And yet he turned his world upside down. With all out, without the bells and whistles. Because it's about the message, not, not all the add-ons. That you get because you've got a lot of people and a lot of money. It doesn't bring power, doesn't create anointing. Only one-on-one -on -one discipleship and teaching the truth. The gospel of the kingdom is what this thing's about. Yeah. Now, I said too much time there, but you got that one for free today. Alright, so John the Baptist is the, is the model. that what God did for John... What God had John look like outwardly is what God's looking for inwardly. A cutoff, a severing. Listen to me. Now listen carefully. John the Baptist had to sever. How long do you think John the Baptist wore this outwardly apparel and ways of life before Jesus showed up? I don't know that. I don't know the answer, but it was, for, it was a while. You know what that means? Before John could do the forerunner, he first had to sever himself from the kingdoms of this world and the religious systems. He's not going to be, Jesus is not going to go get him out of the temple and bring him to the wilderness. He already has to have a severing in his own life before he can preach the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? He can't have one foot in Jerusalem and one foot in the wilderness. So Jesus does not show up until John has severed himself from culture, from the worldly system, from the religious system, right? And then he's, he's faithful to present that message by being apart from that message. So in other words, he can't be the forerunner if he's still down here dealing with the kingdoms of this world trying to do things the world's way. He had, that's why water, but why did he, where does that even come from? You cannot show me in the Old Testament anybody practicing water baptism and there's no, the, there's no theology on it, there's nothing on it. This guy just starts dunking people out of the blue with no, that's why the Pharisee says, who are you and what are you doing? And what authority? Who are you represent? We've never seen anything like this before. What's this water dunking? It's significant. You, John is the one showing you, you have to sever yourself from what I've been severing myself from before you can enter into the kingdom of God. You can't be in both kingdoms. If a man puts his hand in the plow, Jesus said, looks back, what? He's not fit for my kingdom. You can't be playing around with the world system and have dominion at the same time. Dominion can only happen when you live it out of this, out of the kingdom of God. You can't be down here and exercise dominion. Now, however, you can from this kingdom, because he says we're in the world, but not of it. Now I can take this kingdom, being in it. And have to deal with this kingdom, but not be of it. And that's what you see in beautiful picture form. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel in the lion's den. They're not going to bow. They're in the soup. They're in the kingdom of darkness. They're not of it. Because they're of this kingdom. So you're of this kingdom on earth. But you're going to bring heaven on earth from this kingdom. And that's when they're thrown in the fire. Heaven shows up called the fourth man. Huh? D 
Daniel, he's in a lion's den. They don't feed those lions for weeks because they want to see how hungry they are, so they just rip that dude to them. And what happens? God, the kingdom of heaven, shows up and keeps those hungry lions at bay. What do you think that represents? If you stay in this kingdom up here and live from this kingdom down here, you will have dominion in this kingdom. But not if you're mixing and or you're down here and you're trying to win an election and then say you have dominion. That doesn't work. And for those who want to say, well, we're we supposed to vote. Here's, your, here's, here's my thing on voting. I may be wrong on this. My opinion. Because I'm going to live with these people. And I have to say this. I gotta vote for the lesser evil. And I know people hate that, but tell me who's righteous. I can find things wrong with Kennedy if you want to be a blue dog Democrat. I can find things wrong with Ronald Reagan if you want to be ultra right. I can find things wrong with every damn president we've had. As long as they're eating from this tree, they ain't righteous. They're just good or evil. And all good is evil. So I gotta choose the guy who's gonna best represent my belief system to make my life easy down here and not have a dictator in the, in the White House. Does that make sense? Other than that, that's, that's, the best I can do. that's the best I can do. I'll speak into it, but that's all I'm, I, I'm not jumping in bed with it. But I will speak to it from the platform called the Kingdom of Heaven. All right? So dominion is not possible if we do not break with the world system. Why? Because we rule from and conquer with or out from that system. 1 John 3, 8. I think that's where we may be. For this purpose, the Son of Man was manifested. So stop there. Jesus is no longer literally on earth, but he is through you. So he's still being manifested through you for what purpose? To destroy the works of the devil. As salt and light. Just the way we see Jesus doing it and the disciples doing it, Paul doing it. Next. And ultimately this is what happens. This is the consummation. There is an end. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world, all these down here, the kingdoms of this world, what? Have become, have become, the kingdoms of our Lord. Why? Because eternity past, God asked His Son, ask of me and I'll give you the nations. We see it happening in the very end. Finally, all the nations of this world, because the church should be doing what it's doing, rather than jumping on board with all these nations, we stand, we're a standalone kingdom. We speak to these other kingdoms with love, compassion, not condemnation and judgment, but we win them over with love and the message of the kingdom. And then what happens is the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Hmm? Acts 17, 6. While this is happening, while... Although that's the consummation, here's what should be happening today. But when they did not find them, the other disciples, they dragged this dude called Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. So they're making a dent. Without being part of the kingdoms of this world, they're making a dent on this kingdoms of this world by staying within the standalone kingdom of God, God's kingdom. It's within you. But no compromise anything of that nature, just preaching the message of the kingdom, which is Christ and Him crucified. Now, on that outline you have, we're not going to go through it, but there's your chart. I call it a suggestive chronological mapping of both kingdoms as seen in Scripture. Earth as the battleground, but ultimately we winning the earth. Because it says, I'm going to give the earth Psalm, go, go to the Psalms. Is that, that, is that the next one, Psalms? Yeah, look. I'm going to give your, the earth to you as your possession. So the devil doesn't get the earth. <coughs> earth is the battleground right now. But I'm not jumping on the world system's bandwagon. Now here's why I'm saying all this. Let me, let me get through my outline here. All right, God's eternal purpose has always been before the fall and after to set up his kingdom on earth to draw all men unto himself as seen in Eden, Abraham, Canaan, Israel, Jesus, the church, and the kingdom of God. 
a kingdom not of this world, but in man himself. Again, Luke 21, Luke um, 17, 21. By our placement in the Godhead. Don't get time to look through the scriptures. John 14, 20 and John 14, 23. This is all through our union, our placement in the Godhead. The church is the vessel. The vehicle that he partners with, God partners with through union to rule and reign and fill all things, Ephesians 4, 6. God's desire is humanity. His desire is you not to just waste them away, but to win them back to himself. God's desire is for humanity to live out the love and fellowship and beauty and splendor of the Trinity with man forever. Now, the kingdom, now I'm done with this. The kingdom of God is not of this world, but it is for this world. The kingdom is not of this world, but it is for the world. Don't ever forget that, otherwise you'll separate yourself from him to the point of what's the purpose. You separate not to become part of, but to win over. I can't win people over by being like them. I can't win you over by <coughs> having the same mindset you have. I win you over by a different mindset, a different set of truths. Okay? So let me say this again. The kingdom of God is not of this world, but it is for this world. It is heaven born. The kingdom of God is heaven born, but earth bound. Heaven born, but earth bound. Yet never integrates. It's a standalone kingdom. And why are we talking about this? Because you will, the whole, if you can't see this, you do not, you have your head in the sand. I may talk in the next couple of weeks on the cycles of human history. Let me just tell you this, just to give you an idea what I mean by cycles. Here's, here's us, and here's when Jesus returns. That's how we see it as a straight line, with time and space in between. It, human history doesn't work like that. It works in cycles. So while it's in this cycle, it eventually jumps to this cycle. And then it jumps to this cycle, called times and seasons. Then it jumps to this cycle. It's not a straight line from us to Jesus. It's history is cycled. Okay? And when you see these cycles, every 80 years, and it's proven, it's a proven fact, every 80-some years, which is a whole person's lifetime, hopefully, you'll see it go through what they call a winter, a spring, a summer and fall. Winter being hard times for our country. Okay? And you'll see these cycles. And they have mapped this thing out. But regardless, I, I want to show you, we are at a place. And I told you in 2020 that the next 10 years is going to be, is going to be rough. Maybe even longer. But what they're seeing that could be in 2030, it's going to be, and, and I told you, remember I told you that that guy told her in 10 years you won't know your your country from Thursday night. Well, it was he said 20 years. So that would be 13, 23, 33. So he's he's in that he's in that cycle period of what they're saying. And I may teach on that. I don't know. If you want to, if you if you're interested in it, I can do that. It's a, it's along the lines of the book called The Fourth Turning. But when you start seeing these cycles, and every history goes through these cycles, we have to be prepared for whatever comes down the pike. And the good news is, we win. He causes us to triumph in all things. But not, you cannot win and triumph by being a part of this system without that severing. Do you other guys, do you see that how important John is now? That his outward appearance was all about severing, severing, and that's what his ministry was, water baptism. A severing from one kingdom to another. Paul, come out from among them and be separate. I was going to say any questions or comments, but this is a Thursday night. <laughs> Let's stand. We are on the winning side. I mean, that's the good news. You guys want to see us through. He saw Israel through everything. He's saying that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. We can have hope in the hardest of times. Only if we're living from that kingdom. That's it. You can sabotage your life by living from the other kingdom.
thank you, Lord. This is about Jesus and his kingdom. The message, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. Kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. We've got to be kingdom minded. Because that keeps us severed from the kingdoms of this world. Father, we bless you. We thank you for your son. You didn't leave us in this world to be part of it. You left us in this world to change it by speaking from your kingdom. Not integrating with the kingdoms of this world, but being a standalone kingdom, speaking to the other kingdoms with love, compassion, and mercy. The, the gospel of Christ. The gospel called good news. The gospel of grace. Help all of us here this morning find our placement. We've already been placed in the Godhead. Now help us find our placement, our eternal purpose. The question is, what is the Lord doing today? And are we willing to go with Him? Are we going to co-labor with Him as His ambassadors and represent His kingdom? Not be part of the kingdom that were other kingdoms of this world that we're in, but to represent His kingdom to speak into these other kingdoms the gospel message. Let's lift up the bread. This is our life. The bread of heaven that gives life to all men. We're bringing life to the nations. Not bad news. We're bringing good news. We're bringing Jesus. We're manifesting Jesus in darkness. Manifesting light in darkness. You are the light of the world by representing Jesus. Partaking of his nature and manifesting his light. Let's partake. And the good news is he's not against them. He's not against them. Their sins have been forgiven. He's not at war with them. If we could see that he was never at war with them, but they were at war with him. God's not condemning. We don't have a message of condemnation. We don't have a message of judgmentalism, self-righteousness. We have a message of hope, of forgiveness, and unconditional acceptance and unconditional love. And we are experiencing that today in our own personal lives. Let us share it with the kingdoms of this world. No judgment. No condemnation. It's the good news of the gospel of grace. It's the kingdom and the message. It's for taking.